All right. With that, guys, we're, uh, we're going to be heading into a new book study at the end of the year, or at the very end or the very beginning of the year. You're going to be going to the book of Acts. But today, and while we were, uh, we were out, I had a few things that really came to mind. And I've got to tell you just how thankful Stephanie and I are for this fellowship and those who serve here and call CCDV home. You may have noticed, but last week we weren't here. And it's a good thing because we went away. And we had an opportunity to be with our girls over the Thanksgiving holidays. And it was amazing. We got to spend some time. And it was terrible. The weather was just absolutely atrocious at the beach. Um, <laughs> so much so I had to put a shirt on because it was a little warmer than I thought it was going to be. And then we got to fellowship and go to the girls' church in, uh, in Orlando. And that's the picture that you see there. But it was amazing to be able to do so. And we enjoyed it so much that we actually, because they had a break in their schedule, grabbed Catherine and Christine and brought them home with us. So you guys... Get to see them for another week or so, so love on them. We're, we're glad. Okay, you can, you can go ahead and take that down. That was great. Yeah, a yeah. little beach time there. Nothing wrong with that. But during the time away, I got to really thinking about the blessings of the Lord, and you guys came to mind. I mean, this fellowship came to mind because while we were gone, things here at the fellowship kept going. Things kept going just as they were, and it was done by those who are completely in love with God and completely in love with each other. And guys, it's amazing to be able to, to do so and to be so thankful for those. And even though it's great to be missed and it's great to come back and it's great to have, have, have this aspect of reunion, my wife and I and my family are so thankful for those that God has called to oversee this fellowship. Pastor Craig and his wife, his family, actually his entire family that's here. We've got all the elders and their wives. We've got those that just serve continually in relationship to the building projects and things that are going on and the maintenance of the church. And all of this just represents such an amazing amazing blessing and guys understand this is exactly how church is supposed to be and while i like being depended on i like the fact that you guys are more dependent upon god than you are on me amen because see that's why we come here we come here to fellowship and to worship god and so it's an amazing amazing blessing for me and my family and i just want you to know that with a grateful heart and looking at especially during the week of thanksgiving i was greatly thankful for you guys and so welcome back i'm glad you're here during the time away, I'd also kind of hope that things would settle down a little bit. But I find that we're still in our current mystery horror drama titled 2020. The lack of information in any aspect of stability is making it impossible to set any kind of plans. And while we rapidly approach the end of the year, the reality is, is we're not sure if there's going to be an end to the drama, if any, as we would look going forward. And the hardest part for me is the not knowing. The hardest part for me is the lack of information and, and this aspect of stability which makes it impossible to plan or go forward or make decisions. And if you're any planners in here, you have folks that like them, it doesn't drive you crazy when you can't make a plan. Makes me nuts. And while we're still wondering how everything is going to turn out, I believe that this sense and feeling of uncertainty is shared amongst a lot of different folks. A feeling of an anticipation that maybe something bad is coming, but we don't know how bad. We just know it's going to be bad. If we could just identify the worst case scenario, how many of you like playing that game? Worst case scenario. If I could just come up with the worst, worst case scenario. And about the time that we think we've got the worst, guess what? It gets worse. And we have to start all over again. It's just the other day, we had differing flights, and I was taking Catherine to the airport in the morning before we left in the afternoon, and we're having a conversation about open and door closed, or, or closed doors, how God opens doors and how he closes doors and how we as his people are, are, are really striving and would, would prefer to always walk through the doors that God opens and to not try to kick down the doors that he closes, and we're really trying to stay in touch with it. The problem that I've had this year, doors are hard to identify. It's hard to tell what doors are open, what doors are closed, what is God doing in the midst of everything that's been going on. And, and, and it brought to mind, well, it brought to mind mass confusion in relationship to doors. And, and rather than trying to explain it any further, let me just have you watch this. This is kind of where my door head was. Chasing open and closed doors, trying to figure out what it is that we're supposed to do. The information keeps changing. And while that might provide us with a little bit of comic relief under our present circumstance, the reality is, is there's nothing funny about where we are right now, is there? 
I mean, we're not in a time when we can look at things and just go, wow, this, this is all just something that we can shake off. And yet, here's what I want you to know before we go any further today. Here's what we need to context and frame everything that's happening in 2020 thus far and going forward into. Listen, listen, listen. God is in control. God's in control. He's not shaken by what's going on in the country or even in the world. And none of this, listen, listen, none of this is a problem to him. He is the sovereign God of the universe. Everything that's happening is happening in full view of him, in his full control, in his full plan of what it is that he has for us in the entering into and the spreading and the sharing of his kingdom. Our God is unchangeable. Our God is unshakable. He's unstoppable because He is truly God alone. And guys, there's no turning in Him. Guess what? Also, Jesus, last time we checked, He's still on the throne. He's still the King of kings. He's still the Lord of lords. So all of these things that we're seeing today causes us to to come here in this place today, not heavy-hearted, but coming in the celebration of the fact that God is our God and we are His people. Amen? And so we don't need to be afraid about what's going forward, and God would not have us to be afraid. And so today I want to spend some time reminding us that we have victory in Jesus, that we are not those that are victimized. We are already victorious. And I want to remind us that we don't need to to let the circumstances and the uncertainty of life dictate how we live our lives. You see, the world doesn't get to dictate to us as believers in Jesus Christ, how it is that we need to view the world. Our view needs to be in the eyes of and through the eyes of the God that is in control and and the the Savior that came to provide us eternity. I want to remind us of just how blessed we truly are. How blessed we are by a a loving Savior who is still Lord over all. And as I started to look at how best to frame a message in this area, I kept being drawn back to a time when Israel also found themselves in very, very uncertain times. And so I want to bring us to a place of victory by visiting something that is very familiar to you guys all, or should be in Scripture. Turn to Numbers chapter 6 in your Bibles. Numbers chapter 6. And we'll be starting around verse 22. But it's a place that if you've been here for a little while, if you've been at the fellowship for any time, you are very, very familiar with this because you've heard it at the end of every single service that we've done since we opened. And today I want to begin where we normally end. In verse 24 of number 6, it says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. How many of you heard that before? Yeah, how many of you know that that's that's how we end every service here, every time we gather, every time that we bring ourselves together? And guys, again, if you've been here, you know that this is the blessing that God gave to Moses to give to the priests, that the priests would speak over Israel any and every time that they came together, that they assembled before they would leave. And the blessing was given when the people were wandering in the wilderness. It was given in a time where there was great uncertainty. The people were unsure of what was going to happen next. Everything in their lives had been flipped upside down, and there was no way for them to clearly see anything in the future. It was a time such as the time that we're in, when God instructed Moses, have the priests remind the people every time that they're in front of them, every time that they see them, that they are under my blessing. That I'm a God that wants to bless. I'm a God that cares about them. And God didn't want His people. He doesn't want Israel. He doesn't want us. He doesn't want anyone that calls Him Lord to live in a place of fear even amongst and even in uncertain time. His desire is to bless us and to keep us. Amen? And guys, I know that this is what God wants us for today. So, He doesn't accept. And we talk about things that God doesn't like. I don't think God accepts it when His people are in fear. I don't think that He approves when we would say, I'm worried about, I'm concerned about, I'm afraid for this, I'm afraid. And, and I'm trying to, as I, as I continue in this process, and the older I get and the closer that I walk with the Lord, I'm trying to remove that word from my vocabulary. I'm trying to remove the word, well, you know what I'm afraid of. Anybody said that in the last couple of weeks? You know what really concerns me? 
what really worries me, and the whole time God's going, what are you doing? I've told you that you're not supposed to be afraid, that you're not supposed to be worried about things. That doesn't mean that we're not supposed to pay attention. It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to do and share in the process. It's not a, it's not a, a, a complete avoidance of everything in reality, but what it is is it's a framing of what's happening around us with the knowledge and the understanding that God is in control. He's the God that blesses and keeps us. And how important it is that we would maintain that mindset. But see, if our view of God is that He's distant from us, if it's, our view of God is that He's disinterested or even that He's angry, then the problems will rise above and it will cause great fear. But if we see God as sovereign, if we see Him as the ruler of the universe, we can't have any fear. Oh, if we see God as condemning, if we see Him as one who, who brings about not only condemnation, but judgment upon us, then we're going to live in constant doubt and constant worry. But if we are those who view God as one who wants to bless and wants to keep us, then we're going to live a life of great expectation, a life of great joy, and a life of great confidence. How many of you want to live in joy, expectation, and confidence right now? Guess what? It's available. It's there. This blessing that was given by God to Moses to give to the priests to have them speak wasn't just a casual thing. It wasn't a once in a while type of thing. This blessing, again, was to be spoken over the people every time that they came together. Why? Why do you think they need to be reminded that God blesses? Because we forget. Did any of you during the course of the last couple weeks forget that you were blessed by God? Be honest. Why? Because you're so focused on the other things that are going on. It's like, oh my goodness, how can this be happening? I'm going to remind you, God likes to bless us. I want to take some time this morning. It's familiar, but I want us to look at this passage, and I want to look at it in every aspect of what it is. And I want it to be that we would come to the place of remembering and being reminded, especially as we'll take also time to go to the Lord's table, to be reminded, even in uncertain times, that we serve a God that desires to bless and to keep us. Amen? Look at verse 22. We're going to back up one. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Now, God's introduction to this is very, very simple. His instruction even more so. And yet, it speaks to the whole of the priesthood, and it speaks to anyone who calls Christ Lord. This is the way that you shall bless Israel the children of Israel. This is the way that you bless people that believe in God. This is how you do it. Now, how many of you have tried to bless people in other ways? How many people do we have in here that have, from time to time, just tried to make somebody else happy? That doesn't work all the time, does it? You know, happiness is a very fleeting thing. Happiness only works when you're getting your way. If you want to define happiness, happiness is best defined is that as when I am achieving and getting my way, then I will be happy. The moment that that ceases to be so, I become what? Unhappy. Oh, but it says that if we really want to bless somebody, if we really want to bring somebody to the place of understanding, and this hit a special place in my heart because my goal, my, my whole, whole process of being a pastor, of being, an, being a leader and a teacher is I want folks to be blessed. I want you guys to be blessed. I want you to leave here today blessed. I want you to leave here today knowing and, and sensing the presence and the closeness of God in your life to where you know that you are within His sight and His reach. And so as I looked at this, I got to thinking, man, this is also something, though, that shouldn't all of us have the same heart as those who call Jesus Lord, that our, our goal would be to bless other people. Now, <laughs> some of the conversations that we've had lately probably were not along the lines of blessing people. We may say that we blessed somebody when they pulled into our parking spot, but that wasn't what we were doing. When we think about the communications and the conversations that we have and the things that we say, we need to understand it's easy for us very often to try to do things in our own strength, but we will find is that, well, we really can't make anyone in our strength blessed or find a place of peace because it's not our place to do so. You see, it's not my place and again, I go back to that thought of being away and having everything continue the way it was. I know that when I'm here, different things happen and things happen differently because it's good when I am here. And God has called me here, and this is why I'm here. All right? But the reality is, is it's not my place 
to make sure that you guys are blessed and happy. That's what God does. Oh, it's my place to tell you that, to remind you that, to take you to his word and to walk you through it and to encourage you in the process of drawing close to him. But the blessings that come don't come from man to man. Blessings that come, come from God to man. And if you ever want to bless somebody, the best way to bless them is to remind them of the blessings of God. And guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that during the course of the last couple of weeks, I've been short on using God's blessings instead of just trying to use my own in communications with people instead of encouraging it's been kind of a well a pity party anybody besides me oh now we've got good reason right so when you get together with all those friends and you get together with that person especially somebody that agrees with you it's great to argue argue against somebody that doesn't but it's even more fun to complain when somebody is on your side because then you get to jump in all together and you get to have that old misery loves company kind of thing going on right oh yeah let's talk about all the things that are wrong and you know what I found is I'm reading this thing and I'm going, wait a minute, that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. Instead of talking about everything that's wrong, it says this is how you will bless the people. Not by talking about everything that's wrong, but instead pointing them to a God that desires to bless them and to keep them. Amen? To bless you. We need to keep a, a, a constant perspective on the fact that regardless of what's going on out here, regardless of what's happening in front of us, God's intention, His desire is to bless God's desire is not just an attribute of our relationship, but it's the foundation of our relationship with God, and it goes all the way back to the very beginning. So when we see the words, the Lord bless you, or may the Lord bless you, it's not a new thing. It's not something that is just, just a, a fashionable thing to say within Christendom, because it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, the first thing that He did in relationship to fellowship and interaction with them is he blessed them. Well, then we go just a little bit further in Genesis 9. You know, when Noah and his family came off the ark, the first interaction that he had, the first thing he did, it was a process by which God blessed them. Move a little bit farther into Genesis, and we see the covenant that was made with Abram. And what did God say? He said, I'm going to change your name. You're now Abraham, and now I'm going to bless everyone that comes from you. A blessing that was bestowed upon him. Throughout Scripture, all the way through, we see that God's desire, even in the midst of disobedience, even when we're doing something wrong, even when we need to be corrected and disciplined, God's desire is to bless us. When Jesus was ascending back to the Father after his resurrection, the last thing that he did in the instruction and in the admonition of those that were seeing him go is he turned and he blessed them. You see, the very, very first interaction that God had with man face-to-face -face, came with a blessing. The very last face-to-face -face interaction with God and man, as Jesus went back to the Father, he blessed. See, this isn't just something that God thinks about from time to time. It isn't something he does casually. This is the nature, the character of God. The very essence of God is that which chooses, desires, and wants to bless. Here's what I want you to hear. Living in uncertain times, in times of great hardship and difficulty, doesn't change God's desire. You know what changes? Is our attention span on it. And this is what I caught myself doing over the course of the last couple of weeks. I caught myself in the place of being distracted by what was going on and forgetting, if you will, <laughs> that God is a God that blesses even in the midst of the blessings. I mean, even in the midst of walking in the... You know how easy it is to have everything going your way and still complain? Does anybody besides me do that? Help me. Just me. So we see the Lord's desire to bless. But then it also says, and keep you. And keep you. Equal to the Lord's desire to bless is His willingness to keep us. And this whole aspect of keeping is the same idea as providing guardianship over us. It's a, it's a protection. It's to keep us secure, regardless of the circumstances and the conditions, to keep us safe and to keep us within His sight. I love what it says in Psalm 91.11. It says, For He shall give His angels charge over you 
to keep you in all your ways. I love the promises of God that says that he's watching over me, that he's protecting me. You know, we talk about it, we sing about it, we talk about understanding and recognizing that God is with us all the time, but do we literally walk in the steps of our day recognizing the presence of God right with us? And if we do, it changes how we see things. If we already know that he's there, why don't we live as if he is? Oh, and I bring that to myself as much as I do to you because it's been easy the last couple of weeks to just like, ah. But guys, when we come to salvation through Jesus Christ, listen, when we come to salvation through Jesus Christ, we are in the place of being kept by Him. We're in a place of safety, in the place of understanding the security of, that can only be found in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And as we do, we'll recognize that Jesus is the only one that can keep us. And you know what? There's so many people out there that are running around trying to find ways to be kept, trying to find ways to find security, trying to find ways to feel comfortable, to feel like like, like they're they're in some situation of protection. And guys, it's been funny because I've been watching it, and you know... I get kind of the same ads that you get when you're, when you're looking around. You know, be careful what you say in your house around this time of year if you got one of them Googles or one of those, those other Alexa things because they're listening to you. If you don't think they are, just, t- just start mentioning a product and watch, see it'll pop up on an, on an email. All right? They're listening to you. They got your number. But it's interesting because what I've, what I've found is, is, is that There's only one means by which we really can find peace. We really can be held together, and we have to go to the one that is capable of holding it all together. And I love what Colossians 1 and 16 says. Colossians 1 and 16. It says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Say amen. By him, being Jesus, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things. And in Him all things consist. Now, we've done the Greek study on the word all, so we don't have to go back through that. All means what? All. So when it says, in Him all things, some translations say hold together. Consist. Everything in your life, everything that is physical, everything that is mental, everything that is spiritual, everything that is emotional, everything you can touch, feel, see, smell, anything, if it's there, if it's created in this world, it is being held together by Jesus Christ. That's everything. The chair you're sitting on right now is being held together by Jesus Christ. Oh, even the scientists are baffled because it doesn't make any sense. The, the stuff, the, 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 what is matter and what is, what is held together within the, the, the universe shouldn't be able to stay together. It doesn't work that way. Guess what? I know why it does. It's because Jesus Christ is holding it together. And so if your life is struggling right now, if you're falling apart, if you feel like things are all out of control, and if you're having all these worries and all these concerns, don't. You're being held together if you choose to recognize by the only one that can hold it together, by Jesus Christ who holds all things. It goes on in verse 25. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Oh, this is amazing. Because it speaks again of the presence of God in our lives, face to face. This idea of face to face. And how many of you have ever thought, how many of you have ever wished, man, I wish I could just see God. I just wish God would show up in a, in a real physical way that I could see Him. Right? And, and we know that in these bodies, in this present condition, that we can't see God. And we see that given to us in Scripture to where God is not attainable in our present condition. And yet, it tells us here that this idea is, is that we can be so close in our relationship with God that literally that His face would be available for us to look into. And when we do, in that close relationship, what we see is we see God smiling at us. I love that. I love the idea of God smiling at us. And this is so important. Listen, listen, listen. When man looks upon God's face, he's going to see one of two faces. The unregenerated man, the man who is not covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, is going to see the face of a righteous and holy judge. It's the only face that you can see. 
if you haven't accepted and come to the place of salvation in Jesus Christ, this is what God has represented in the life of that one who is unregenerated, who is unrepentant. But when we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, then we see a good Father then we see one that's full of love and full of grace. What we see is God's face shining and literally beaming because we've been brought into a right relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, this is something that, that, that yeah, it may be hard for you to look at. It may be hard for you to understand. It may even make you a little bit uncomfortable to think that when you look into God's face that He actually looks at you and smiles. How many of you have had a different a different relationship with authority figures when you look in their face. But as we talked earlier, how we see our circumstances is going to be a reflection of how we see God. And Christian, if you've never thought about how God looks at you, you need to. When we're in Christ, God looks at you with great favor and great joy. You bring, you bring joy to the Lord of, to, to, or to the, the face of your Father when we're in His Son as if we're His favorite child. How many of you know that I'm God's favorite? Oh, well, you are too. You see, that's one of, Oh, that's right. No, it's you. How many of God's favorites do we have in here? Then start acting like it. Then start acting like a favored child. Start acting like not a, not a spoiled, rotten brat. But as a favored child, what is it that, that gains the favor of God is not our works, is not our deeds, it's our heart towards Him, it's our love and our investment and our trust of His Son, Jesus Christ. And the Lord looks down upon us and it says, and His face just beams, it just shines on us. Oh, look at Him. Oh, you are so good. Have you ever had that experience with a child where they're doing something that just like tickles you and it just, <laughs> I can sit and watch that for hours. Zephaniah 3 and 17. Zephaniah 3, 17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst. The Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love, and He will rejoice over you with singing. Is that how you see God? Is that how you see God the Father in your life? Do you see Him as a Father who is rejoicing over you, who is singing over you, who is, who is looking at you with great joy? Or are you more along the lines of trying to hide from Him because you think you're always doing something wrong? And yet as we would find ourselves in Christ, as we would find ourselves drawing close to and, and seeking Him first, this is how God sees us. Right now, I would hope after the last couple of weeks that just thus far into the message that this is like, oh, wow, this is really encouraging. I was really glad he wasn't going to go to one of those places in the Old Testament that's a bummer. Because we can, and we probably will on Wednesday night. But you need to understand, regardless of what's going on in the world, regardless of what's happening in our circumstances, regardless under what condition we find ourselves in, this is where we need to start every day. This is where we can start every day. We need to live in the reality of God's blessing and in the security and in the aspect of His joyous presence. We need to start every day with the knowledge that we bring joy to the Lord when we draw close to Him through Jesus Christ. And see, it doesn't matter what's going on around us. If we are in Christ, God's face shines upon us. And this is what we need to be telling other people. Rather than joining in with the conversation about how bad things are, rather about ragging about how this didn't happen and this did happen and can you believe that this took place and I can't believe that that took place and all of those conversations that we've been having, rather than doing that, what we need to do is we as believers, we as those that know, need to stop and say, yeah, but... As we trust Jesus, God's face is going to smile upon us. Boy, that'll change the conversation around the water cooler, won't it? You see, we're supposed to be those agents of change. 
Because if there ain't no change in our lives over what Christ has done and what we trust and what we believe and what we know to be true, then what's the point of being anything other than just miserable like the rest of the world is miserable right now? Even those that think they want are still miserable. They haven't won anything. There's only been one victor, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he won it all. So it doesn't matter what happens in the rest of it because there's one, one election <laughs> that's important, and it's whether or not you have chosen to be chosen and to be elected into the kingdom of heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's the one that matters. We need to be those that are pulling ourselves up and pulling others up with us. And as we do, we can look into the face of a loving and a gracious Father. And in verse 26 it says, The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. His countenance. Folks, when we're in the presence of the Lord, when we're looking into His face, we are going to experience peace. This whole aspect of countenance has to do with how we see others looking at us. And this is something that I love to do. This is one of my favorite things, actually. I love kids in distress. And it may be something as simple as some kid in a grocery basket at Walmart or something, right? I mean, you, you, you've seen that child is just not happy, right? And for whatever reason, the parents are just incapable at that particular moment or they've already run out of stuff or they've just lost all of their patience and they're just not even dealing with it. And the child is just having a meltdown, right? I love to make faces at them. I do. I love, to, I love to try to make a face that will distract them away from their current situation and, and allow my countenance, my favor, my face, my expression to be that that raises their spirits. Now, understand, it doesn't always work. That's when I walk away and act like I did nothing. I have no idea what happened to that child. Bad child. <laughs> Evil child. <laughs> no. This is what God wants to do with us. If you had that situation where you've been in the grocery basket of life <laughs> and you didn't want to be there and you're kicking and screaming because you're not getting your way and things aren't going well and you feel constrained and you feel restrained and you don't feel like you're going to get what you want out of things and you're just screaming. And, and wouldn't it be so neat if you would stop or just have your attention drawn off of the current circumstances just long enough to look into a face that is smiling and it is doing everything that it can to lift you up. And that's what it says God's face wants to do for us. He wants to lift His countenance upon. He wants His countenance, countenance, which is perfect, which is peaceful, which is joyous, which is righteous, which is holy. Everything that we desire is within the countenance of God. And it says that we want that to be lifted up upon us. His desire in this blessing is that He would have His attributes transferred and available to us in such a way that we would receive them and take advantage of them. But we have to be looking at Him. You see, when we're not looking at Him. When we're looking at the world, our countenance is going to look like the world. Oh. How you been lately? If you've been bummed and you've been, been ticked off and you've been upset and you've been anxious and you've been worried lately and all of those things, I can tell you it's not because you're looking at God and seeing Him looking at you. Amen? Is that, is that easy? I mean, is that fair? Oh. So if you continue to do that beyond today, you're doing it because you want to. When we look into the loving countenance of our God, we see a good Father. A good Father that brings us peace, but we have to be, again, in the place of looking his, in His direction in order to have this peace. And we're not going to have peace when we're looking at the problems of the world. The peace that comes from God, though, is a peace that's beyond anything that we can ever provide for ourselves. And again, we know the Apostle Paul in one of our keystone as a believer verses in Philippians 4 and 7. What does it say? Be anxious for everything. Oh, I'm sorry. Be anxious for nothing, but in some things, no, everything, by prayer and supplication, with grumbling, well, see, I'm just reading it like I sometimes feel it. No, it says, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Do you see how that works, though? 
if we will go to God in everything, not being anxious, with thanksgiving, it says that the peace of God will guard my heart and my mind. Isn't that the part that's failing right now is our hearts and our minds? We think about it and we get depressed and our hearts get crushed and we get beat up and it's, and it's just like, oh man, I'm just broken hearted over everything that's going on. God says, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> come to me, don't be afraid. You come to me, you focus upon me and I want to take and I want to guard your heart and I want to guard your mind. <laughs> and then he says, in exchange for doing that, I will give you a peace that will blow your mind. Those are my points. I'm going to give you a peace that goes beyond your ability to understand, your ability to comprehend. And guys, I, I, I saw, so often talk to people that don't understand, well, how is it at this time I can have peace? How is it with everything that's going on that we can't be upset? How is it that we can have, have this peace that goes beyond our understanding? Because it goes beyond our understanding. As long as you're still trying to figure it out, as long as you still got a plan, as long as you're still counting on something to happen that hasn't happened yet, as long as there's still something that you're inserting into the process, you're never going to experience the peace that passes your understanding. We got to be at the place of going, I don't understand, I can't understand, I'm not even going to try to understand. This is so far beyond me, this is so far out of my reach that all I can do is trust. All I can do is thank God that He is there on my behalf and has provided Jesus Christ. And God says, when you do that, when you come to me in prayer and supplication, when you come to me and you focus upon the things that I have given you, then what's going to happen is, is the peace that passes your understanding will be attributed back to you. That's where I want to live right now. I can't understand any of this stuff, can you? I can recognize it very often for what it is. doesn't mean I understand it. The says you don't have to understand it. Gary, quit hurting yourself. You're going to hurt your brain. You're not that smart. Stop trying to figure everything out. Come to me. Trust me. And I'll guard your heart through Jesus Christ. In light of what we see in this blessing... This verse in Philippians makes perfect sense, doesn't it? You see, if we recognize and we continue to understand that we serve a God, that we have a God that wants to bless and wants to keep us, if we keep that in our mindset, then we're going to recognize and then we're going to see how it is that we can potentially have the peace that passes all of our understanding. But we've got to start with the place of recognizing who God is and being in His presence. The place of uncertainty. When nothing seems to make sense, God says, I'll be your peace. I'll provide it for you if you let me. And so, guys, I want you to be encouraged. We are not without the means and without the hope. There's a lot of people that are out there right now that can't attain this and can't reach this because they're not in Jesus Christ. And they need to be on our hearts and we need to be compassionate towards them in order for them to receive what they need in order to experience peace. But, guys, I'm going to talk to you because you're in the room right now. Oh, and you guys are there, too. This isn't something that's out of our reach. This is something that God has promised us. This is the God that says, I want to bless and I want to keep you. I want you to look into my face and see me smiling upon you. I want you to have all of the attributes that are of me betrayed in, or be bestowed into your life so that you then can walk in a peace that goes beyond anything that you can ever understand. And here's where it all comes together. Look at verse 27. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. <laughs> you see, when we have the name of the Lord on us, when we are in Christ and practicing the presence of the Lord, we're going to live in the love of the Lord, in the blessings of the Lord, in the acceptance of the Lord, and in the security and the peace of the Lord. And so that's my goal today. My, my, my whole goal for today is literally to be in this place to where I'm going to, to do the best that I can to put the name of Jesus on you. And then allow God to be the one that says, I'm going to bless you. You see, all I can do is give you the word and give you the message and tell you that you, you, you are part of that which is so cherished and so coveted by God that he desires to bless you, desires to keep you, desires to, to have you be at a place of perfect peace in him. But he also desires that we would be the agents by which that peace would be spread to the rest of the world that desperately needs it. I know that this last month has been hard. 
based on the circumstances that we see going on around us. And I, I, you guys know, I have been very, very open and honest about the fact that I'm not happy about what's going on. But there have also been times within this process that I know that I've taken my eyes off the Lord. And it was through this aspect of seeing only the darkness that it drove me to desire the light. <laughs> I don't want you to think that I'm any better or any worse than you guys are, but the reality is, is that even as your pastor, I have things happen that I don't like and I get down about. Go figure. Oh, I know all you ever see is the positive side of me, right? <laughs> Ask my wife, she'll tell you. <laughs> just like you guys, we have the same hearts, the same thing. And it's, it's just for that and because of that that God has provided us with this that we would take and that we would grab onto it. And it's something that was so, so it was so amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting thinking about this and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking every single Sunday, every single Wednesday, every time we come together, we end every single service with this blessing. We end every single service. We speak this over everybody that's here. But the thing is, is that I don't know if you guys, as, as am I, am I just doing it as a way to close the service? You know, really, it's kind of interesting. About 20 years ago, when I was leading, leading worship over, over Carson City, Christian Fellowship, before it became Calvary Chapel in Carson City, right? And, and was over there doing that thing. It was, it was one of those things, at the end of the service, there was always kind of that, that time, how do you end a service? How do people know when it's time to, you know, get up and leave? You know, do you say, okay, get out? I mean, what, 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 what do you do, right? And the Lord just really impressed on me, speak this blessing over the people. Speak this blessing. Because it's my heart for them. I want them to recognize that every time that they come together, every time that they worship me, that they're worshiping a God that desires to bless you and keep you. And see, I've been walking very much so in the understanding. I, I, I try not to fail to see the blessings of God, but you know what? I kind of got out from underneath that whole aspect of being kept over the last couple of weeks. I kind of I lost the idea that God was really protecting and I felt like I needed to rise up and maybe provide my own protection. Anybody besides me? Oh. God wants to bless us. He wants to keep us. He wants us to recognize and realize that when we come to him as he is, that we'll find peace. So here's what I want you to know. And here's what brought me back to this place of peace for this morning. God loves us. And he wants to bless us. He wants to keep us in the place of his safety and his security. He rejoices over us. His face is shining upon us because we're in his son, Christ Jesus. And his countenance upon us provides us with all of his attributes, his love, his mercy, his kindness, his righteousness, his justice, his holiness are all brought to us within this countenance upon which he looks at his children.